welcome to today's lecture on women in political spaces from early to medieval times myself shruti bip from department of history pgdv evening college university of delhi in today's lecture i would be exploring the relationship between monarchy caste and gender specifically focusing on the central factor for the subordination of the women in the past societies a very important factor that would be discussed in course of the discussion would be the issue of hierarchy when we talk about hierarchy it is imperative to discuss caste hierarchy as well as gender hierarchy as these both were the organizing principles of the early indian social order and were closely interconnected as well in fact a very important factor that was instrumental in subordination of women in society was the issue of effective control there was a need for effective control over women's body not only to maintain the patrilineal succession but also to ensure greater and absolute caste purity and caste as an institution was unique to early indian society uh, a problematic that has emerged in several readings associated with uh, women studies is the detailed discussion and a very monotonous kind of a discussion regarding the status of women however this phrase status of women has limited usage and limited meaning studies of women in early indian history have tended to rather focus more and more on what is broadly described as the status of women and this status of women is largely studied through a limited set of questions like the laws related to marriage then property rights or uh, religious uh, uh, involvements religious practices participation in sacrifices and all these are generally viewed as the status indicators of women however now there is a need and uh, this need has largely been highlighted by uh, scholars who have conducted in depth analysis pertaining to gender with reference to early indian societies so they have pointed out that there is now need of a shift from the study of status to gender relations the limited focus that is associated with status has left a major lacune in our understanding of various socio political cultural processes which have shaped men women as well as several institutions in early india so clearly there is a need to move away from the questions of status or from the issue of status whether it was high or low and to look instead at the entire structural framework of gender relations which means uh, to explore and to understand the nature and basis of the subordination of women and its specific form in early indian society so with this kind of changed uh, uh, attitude and aptitude we need to take up this kind of study related to women Uh, and understand their roles in the past uh, a very important uh, development that needs to be incorporated in this kind of a study is the significance of social and cultural environment although the subordination of women was a common theme of almost all the stages of history and was prevalent in large parts of the world it was not only india specific but the extent and the form of that subordination was conditioned by several socio cultural uh, environment in, in which women have been 
placed. So, it is important to go back and to revisit the context through various uh, sources that are available. Now, if one talks about the textual depiction, then there is a very uh, limited and a very monotonous kind of a description and most of the epic stories do not portray women as powerless, but they define their power as derived from the self-effacement in a relationship of subjugation to the male. So, the complete dependence or the complete reliance and uh, obedience to, uh, to the male uh, members was the hallmark of Indian femininity and this is what also emerges from the textual tradition. Uh, another very uh, important theme that one can outline here is that of the mother goddess. So, Indian mythology has given primacy to the ideal of mother goddess, whether it, it was manifest uh, through uh, different forms of Lakshmi or Parvati or in a more aggressive form uh, like uh, Ma Kali or Durga, uh, basically the power that women derived from their motherhood, from their aspect of motherhood and motherly instinct was considered as the most important and powerful. So, the question that remains is to what extent have the, the traditional forms of goddess worship affected the society's attitude towards women and does the goddess serve to enhance women's status? Does this image of a woman being a representative of a goddess or imbibing in her the qualities of a goddess uh, really enhance her status? And the answer is for all to see, uh, for all of us to see and to reflect on when we look at the condition of women in today's society. Now, uh, a very important alternate paradigm has been raised by and has been explored by several scholars like Catherine Hansen. So, Catherine Hansen uh, gave the concept of Virangana uh, and the, uh, this particular concept compels us to revise the earlier typologies of uh, talking about or understanding the role of women. Uh, as not being limited to epic heroines or goddesses uh, or different kinds of deities, but rather to look at women as, uh, you know, as a brave uh, woman who kind of shared the responsibilities uh, that came with uh, due to their being born in royalty. So, a virangana can definitely be uh, understood as an alternative paradigm of womanhood uh, repeatedly which was surfacing to challenge the patriarchal premises of North Indian society and polity as well as uh, uh, it asserts the female potential for power as well as virtue. So, even in the concept of Virangana, it is not only power or it is not only authority or military prowess or bravery which is the most important uh, ideal, rather a virtuous woman that ideal was never given up. So, the Virangana ideal was adopted by several political and socio-religious reform movements also uh, in the course of 19th century uh, and the prototype of Virangana has undergone considerable metamorphosis with historical as well as cultural developments in the course of entire historical period. So, uh, there are uh, multiple examples which suggest that the Virangana, while not the dominant norm for uh, the high castes of North India, had a continuous presence for several centuries as an alternative female paradigm. Uh, now, uh, before we continue with the concept of Virangana, I would like to share a few readings which specifically focus on the issue of gender identity uh, in early India and how one can uh, talk about emergence of monarchy in North India uh, uh, from 8th to 4th century uh, BCE. Now, uh, there is a book by Kum Kum Roy, The Emergence of Monarchy in North India. This particular book has 
talked about the gradual development of the institutions of power and several ideas of authority which gave rise to a specific form of monarchy in north india during the transitional period of early indian history and when i talk about the transitional period it basically means the transition from uh, the rig vedic society to the later vedic and post vedic period uh, for this particular span we have very sparse archaeological evidence so there is more dependence on the copious textual source material uh, and uh, this kind of uh, textual material has already been in discussed in greater detail in some of the preceding lectures and how uh, these different textual materials produced a variety of differing interpretations as far, uh, as far as the emergence of monarchy was concerned this book focuses almost entirely on the myth and the ritual of the vedic textual tradition reflecting several stages in the evolution of monarchy so roy uh, roy has assumed that the different ideologies were originally associated with different communities uh, and the concept of rajan uh, was finally uh, born out of these di differing ideologies the process of consolidation which led to the dominance of the raja or the rajan ideal in vedic literature also saw some kind of a growing uh, interaction uh, and intermixture of re relatively independent and uh, different communities which ultimately resulted in some kind of a socio economic differentiation both within as well as uh, amongst several groups uh, as a result of these processes what emerged was uh, three important developments these were related to domination authority and ultimately legitimation so while the earlier rituals related to the rig vedic period were used to legitimize the concept of authority Uh, and the concept of authority of the tribal leader uh, gradually these gave these gave way to legitimization of the concept of rajya and by later vedic period they were overshadowed by more elaborate sacrifices like the rajasuya the vajpayee yagya or the ashvamedha yagya which came to be associated clearly with the rising authority of uh, Uh, of the king economically also the performance of these larger sacrifices great, greatly helped in creating a structure of unequal power relationships as well as unequal distribution of the resources because who was ultimately appropriating all the resources that were being uh, uh, offered in these sacrifices of course it was the brahmans and the kshatriyas so king emerged as the cosmogenic center in this entire scheme of things because most of these sacrifices uh, were conceived in cosmogenic terms and while in the beginning the different conceptions of the cosmos were uh, were existing however in course of ritualization and complex uh, uh, sacrifices which became norm of the day there was consolidation of all these ritualistic practices into a single cosmogeny that was centered around the sacrifice itself as the origin of the universe so the well being of society was thought to depend largely upon the continued performance as status and authority were accorded to those who performed it and who were those who were performing these rituals it was invariably the male rulers so uh, the soon there was a concept of ritualistic kingship 
which became very important from later Vedic period onwards. As a result, the king became the human sacrificer that is the Yajmana and the priest uh, or the Brahmana became his uh, ideological accomplice. And as has been pointed out by Kumkum Roy, this resulted in some kind of a universalization and standardization of the sacrifice and it also resulted in incorporation of different communities, different ideologies and different kind of social uh, kind and cultural uh, processes within the political framework of Rajya. So, this is how uh, there was a clear cut relationship between the concept of Rajya as well as these rituals and the sacrifices. And from here now we move on to the next important uh, paradigm and that is an interrelation that emerged between monarchy and patriarchy. Uh, Again, Kumkum Roy uh, has pointed out that an effort was made to mobilize support for the ruler by connecting him, uh, by connecting him with the household uh, in general and by connecting him to the male householder in particular. And as a result, a link between the political power, kinship and the household clearly indicated emergence of a kind of monarchy with clear cut correlationship with patriarchy. So, uh, this kind of over dependence of monarchy on patriarchy clearly kept women away from power politics. Uh, now, a next interesting read, uh, reading that can be shared with reference to this kind of a discussion is uh, that uh, of Suvira Jaiswal caste, gender and ideology in the making of India. In this uh, writing, Jaiswal has researched the evolution of the caste system in India, uh, speci uh, especially with reference to the origins as well as functions. And Jaiswal has shown that in the period, during the period of Rig Veda, the caste system had not really come on its own and it had not really emerged as a complex hierarchy which it soon was to uh, emerge as during the later period. Uh, there was the transformation of the concept of Grihapati that was going on and Grihapati who previously was considered to be head of a family was in fact the leader of an extended kin group. So, in the beginning, the concept of Grihapati did not really mean head of the male member of the family. Rather, it indicated uh, the leader of an extended kin group. The transition from a pastoral to a more sedentary mode of production and uh, the shift from pastoral activities to agriculture uh, was one major change that led to the rising social stratification and differentiation with reference to Grihapati. And it was now that Grihapati became symbolic of the patriarchal principle. So, earlier uh, while Grihapati could be considered as a clan leader, now he came to be looked upon as the male head of the family. So, there was unequal access to both economic political and social power and as pointed out by Jaiswal, neither skin nor color uh, or the notions of race were the basis of caste differentiation or Varna differentiation. It was rather the unequal access to economic and political power that greatly enhanced the status of a few and ultimately resulted in crystallization of a specific hierarchy which again strengthened the power and position of the ruler. So, as uh, one reflects on the early Vedic material milieu, uh, basically one, you know, one can refer to the Rig Vedic uh, cultural and material milieu, uh, during that period endogamy and the hierar hierar hierarchical society, they both resulted in the systematic suppression of women as a category. 
Uh, now, with this kind of a beginning that had already been made during the Vedic period, then there was no looking back in the post Vedic period also. And as has been pointed out by Suvira, uh, there was insufficient surplus production of goods in the Rig Vedic period due to that society largely being uh, nomadic and pastoral. So, therefore, uh, all sections of society were probably engaged in some kind of economic activity or the other. So, that explains probably the greater uh, uh, or the higher status of women during the Rig Vedic period due to this specific reason. So, women had access to education and they had freer movement during the Rig Vedic period. However, when there was a shift from pastoral and nomadic uh, uh, structure to a more settled and agrarian way of life, then definitely there was also change in the lives and uh, gender relations pertaining to women. So, there were changes in kin relations and the household structure during the period of uh, uh, early Indian history. So, the heterogeneous and the more communal householding patterns that existed in the early Vedic period finally were replaced by a single norm that was centered around the concept of Griha and its master that was Grihapati. And this ultimately also boosted hierarchization. Hierarchization at the level of family, at the level of uh, state and the female roles other than those of the wife came to be marginalized and uh, even the relationships between father and the son came to be uh, subsumed, more importance came to be given uh, to the relationship between the husband and the wife. And as has been pointed out by Kumkum Roy, Vedic patriarchy started viewing women as an integral and an indispensable procreative resource which had to be controlled. And because they had to be controlled, th this could only be done through a uh, clear cut marked hierarchy. Uh, as a result, the series of Smriti literature that developed, uh, for example, Manusmriti, which contains more than 2000 verses and uh, arranged in 12 books. This particular text, as so many other Smriti literature, uh, uh, lays down social and moral guidelines relating to the social responsibilities and duties of a householder. And there was lot of emphasis on uh, what kind of life should be lived and specific references were there for the wives in this description. Uh, Manusmriti cannot be ascribed to a single author as it was compiled between 200 BCE to 200 CE. So, it is a work of multiple authorship and as has been pointed out by Suvira Jaiswal, Manusmriti attempted to uphold the patriarchal institution in order to keep women within the domestic sphere and also subordinated by the male members in the household, which in turn had an influence on the wider society as well as the polity. So, as a person entered the householder stage, the position completely changed and uh, there was now a greater emphasis on very responsible behavior in the household. And a lot of emphasis in this entire scheme of things was put on the issue of continuity of lineage. And with this, we come to another very important aspect which continues to prevail till date and that was the birth of a son because it was only a son who could continue the family name and could also offer offerings to the ancestors that is Pithars. Uh, as a result, the control over women's sexuality as well as her reproductive agency became all the more crucial in order to continue the lineage of the patriarchal household. As a result, the main emphasis was put on controlling the sexuality of women and this 
in return, uh, this in turn resulted in the practice of early marriage. So, a number of textual references are there which kind of promoted the concept of early marriage for girls uh, and the age uh, that was uh, recommended was from 8 to 12 years. So, that women could be uh, kind of uh, the, the situation could be avoided in which women came into contact with foreign races who were slowly getting absorbed in Indian society. So, therefore, this was a very uh, a clear uh, kind of a benchmark uh, and the concept of guarding the wife that was promoted in several dharam shastric and dharam sutric literature was promoted. So, the prime duty of a husband was to guard his wife so that the progeny, so that his uh, uh, varna, so that his caste could be kept pure and a number of symbols, rituals and norms came to be evolved in order to achieve this particular goal. And it was in this background that the ultimate ritual of marriage emerged and it became the only ritual that came to be associated with women, while men had so many other rituals to propagate their power, prestige and authority in society. Thank you.